Hello, my friend, and welcome to this episode of A Call to Leadership. I'm Dr. Nate Sala, your host, and I'm so glad you are here. Well, if you've listened long enough to the show, you know I've talked about the power of story, that we are walking in a grand story called life. Giving our story away, telling our story, writing our story down has power, power that goes far beyond what we ever hoped and dreamed. I have invited someone on this show to explain and express and illuminate this concept of storytelling. Deborah Keevan. Can't wait for you to listen in. This is going to be a good one. I'm Dr. Nate Sala, and this is a call to leadership. Deborah, so good to have you on the show today. Thank you, Dr. Nate. Do you prefer Dr. Nate? Nate or Nate's just totally Nate? cool. I just my just my son. The only my the only person I say, do you gotta call? In fact, when I earned my PhD, he said, Dad, do I have to call you Dr. Dad? And I said, no, but it wouldn't hurt. (laughs) (laughs) Depends on how much money you're asking for, right? (laughs) Right. Which is really a good segue because you are uh, someone I'm so glad that you're on the show to talk about the the importance of words and how words matter. And uh, our listener knows that this is very near and dear to my heart. And how words, I believe the tongue is one of the most, most powerful instruments on the planet to build or to destroy and, Absolutely. and, 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 the, and the power of words and, and perhaps getting into this idea of, of, of pain and, 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 and healing and the challenges and the traumas we face in life, especially today uh, in life and in, in the world and, and how we can use that uh, to, to, uh, to bring uh, about health and well being, And so that, that's, the, that's, that's a, what a great topic, right? It's a, such an important topic and one that I think we often overlook. Mm. And so let's start right there. When we are overlooking, it means that we probably aren't thinking about it, probably thinking about other things in our lives. And we rarely, rarely find there's lots of there's lots of different issues. And where do I want to start this with? I'll start with this. I was li- re- recently listening to a TED talk and uh, the gentleman was talking about teens and I have a teen right now and I'm doing my due diligence and just studying about the teen life and the teen brain and just how I can better connect with my teen, understand and empathize. So I've been listening and learning and discovering. Well, the gentleman was telling stories about his his childhood and his youth and uh, his, his, uh, his bullied as a child. Uh, he was 400, uh, just under 450 pounds. And so he was, he was just treated very poorly in his school. And he thought every day, if he didn't wake up the next day, that's what he would pray for, that he would just not wake up. It was just so traumatic. And so he tells the story as he moves into a season of victory in his life. And then he becomes a counselor, helping children to, he said, to, to simply be uh, a, a scene, not be invisible because he went through his life at a certain point, he was invisible and he shared these stories, these, these compelling stories. And he was moved through the stories of not only his own upbringing, but then of course, how he was able to help others as he became a counselor. And of course, now he's able to help many multitude of others simply because they've listened to this Ted talk. I saw there was over 30 million. Wow views of this talk. It was so moving. I mean, so inspiring. In fact, I'll, I'll have it in the show notes uh, as well for, for any listener that wants to, to, to be a part of that and see that. I guess the point I'm making is that it, 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 he wasn't sharing all the data. Some of it was data on you know children, and but he was just he was sharing his own journey and, and, and the challenges and the struggles, but also the triumphs. There's such great I- power in that. And I think that that's, you know, there's so many entry points into what you just talked about. But what really strikes me is that this gentleman is speaking from a place that has been healed. He's not speaking in what I would call victim energy. He certainly was a victim of bullying. He certainly, as you said, triumphed through that and that evolution to where he's now able to make a positive impact but by sharing his story in a vulnerable way, he shows that he has lived that life and he can then better connect on that level. And I think that that's so such an important part of that healing process. It's 
being able to be seen, being willing to share, even though I'm sure having been someone who I used to call myself the stealth bomber, I would, I would do great work, but I would fly beneath the radar because it was not safe for me to be seen as a child and serves. We all have trauma on some level. And, and at some point we get to decide what those stories mean for us and how they can serve others by sharing them. Interesting. What those stories mean. We decide. It's interesting because that's that's true in that how we define what they mean is a choice. It is. And when we're children, we don't think that way. And it's interesting um, that it for me, I had a story that ha- something that happened to me as a child, just linking to this this gentleman's story where my mother actually kidnapped me. And then she tried to kidnap my brother. My brother, who was nine at the time, didn't go with her. And for 40 years, I decided that me going with her meant that I made poor decisions. And I was in therapy one day, and I just happened to toss this little nugget out that I'd been abducted by my own mother. And she stopped and she said, who are the adults here? Now I was, I was at that time, I was a mother. I had young children and I thought about it from a mother perspective, like these were children. So her assignment was to go talk to my brother and my brother had a story as well. And his story was that he cared more about his stuffed animals than he did his mother. And it was at that moment that we both were able to finally talk about our lived experience. And we, we both kind of realized that we were carrying stories that weren't true, but we were looking at them through the eyes of our younger selves. Mm. Wow. And by speaking it and talking about it, you can invite, in, in, you know, invite healing. Yeah. I make great decisions. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sometimes we we stuff it. In fact, probably more often than not, we 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 want to bury it. It's the past. Perhaps sometimes people feel it's embarrassing. Sure. Uh, sometimes people feel shame about their past. Absolutely. And, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be traumatic past. It can be a triumphant past. Say, for example, someone had a family history that their family was. I'm using air quotes. Normal, right? Uh, there was no family abuse. There was no family trauma. Right. There was just a, it was a, a, and they may feel, they may feel embarrassed about that because, well, you know, I don't want to tell anybody about my family was normal. That's then someone's going to judge me and say that, oh, you had a good life, right? You, how could yeah. you ever understand? I mean, there's always, there's, there's all these different ways that, again, like you said, the interpretation, the stories we tell ourselves. Right. Yeah, my husband has uh, had a, a storybook upbringing. His parents were childhood sweethearts. He had, a, I mean, a lovely upbringing. And he will say things like, I feel really bad that I didn't have any challenges in my life. I was actually had a really great life. And then that's a default. And I'm like, that's a gift. And again, it's the perspective that we look at it with. It's like, I would have given my right arm to have a childhood like yours. Yeah, absolutely. And I look at it like that's that's hope uh, for folks like uh, like like ourselves. I mean, I grew up in a broken home. My parents were divorced when I was young. Lots of challenges. And when I see the 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 ways that families have cohesiveness and have health that I didn't get to experience, then I look at that as a preservation. And so that preservation to me is inspiring because it tells me that there are better paths and better ways that I can embark and embrace. So, so, so in that saying that there's, then you can make the argument that there are no stories that aren't worth telling. I agree. Because there's a benefit and a blessing to each journey that each person partakes, no matter how they see it. And I think that's a, that's a, that's an important distinction because we can talk ourselves right out of being a blessing to others by our own, you know, I, one of our, one of my students calls it head trash, right? Just, a, oh yeah. yeah. And I think that that's really important because if we're telling, think about it, I always say, if you're, 
If you feel called to tell your story, how it will be of service to others. And I don't mean that as in your story is not worth telling, but put that lens on and how is sharing my story going to uplift others, provide hope, provide connection, provide inspiration. And it can do all of those things. But if we're looking at it that way and we're sharing with the intention of, but we're sharing honestly our truth and how we, usually it's a, a story of triumph, right? In, in some in some ways, but we normalize the sharing. And that builds such connection. Yeah. With people we may not even ever even meet. I mean, you may never meet this gentleman who gave this TED talk, but he inspired you and you talking about it will inspire others to go hear him. It's a ripple effect, a beautiful that's ripple effect. That's right. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to ask him if he wants to be on the show. Let's do that. Right. Do it. <laughs> so, but that's, that's the beauty of the mediums that we have available to us to share our story. And it, you know, the way I the way I look at it like is life is a series of chapters. And I've talked about this on on the on the program. And sometimes the chapters are challenging and there's a plot and there's tragedy. Uh, sometimes it's a season of peace and, and rest and and so on. And of course, the old Ario Speedwagon song. I love the quote. If you're tired of the same old story, maybe it's time to turn some pages. So, I mean, look, this is the beauty of it. And 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 it is a tapestry uh, of experiences yeah. that we get to not only partake in, and sometimes, yeah, they are challenging. Sometimes they're hurtful, and sometimes you may be in a situation. I had a uh, a guest who attempted uh, suicide twice because the road was so incredibly dark. But just sharing that story, and and sharing the hope that he has, is if it's just one person, like you said, exactly. you know, who 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 may be served by it to help them along their journey. Well, then it's yeah. worthy. And it takes a lot of courage, you know, to say, I almost took my life, not once, but twice. Here's what I learned. And yeah. this is my life isn't perfect because I think, you know, we, we, you know, social media has its pluses, but it also has some negatives in terms of, you know, Facebook, the, the highlight reel of people's lives. And I think, we're living in such a time of disconnection that we really, I feel, need to tell our stories and need to tell them in a way that offers that hope and offers that, here's my hand. I've been there. I know what you're going through. Yeah. Yeah. The transparency, the vulnerability, of course, just being natural. This is, mm -hmm. and the thing about stories, when you're telling your story, uh, they're in some ways, uh, as long as they're true and honest, they're irrefutable. It's not like you're saying, hey, this is what you should do. This is simply the my path that that I've taken. And here, uh, here's what my trajectory is. Do you recommend writing the story out? I do, because for me, the act of writing actually is part of the healing process. And when, when I work with people who are telling, you know, writing their memoirs, for example, um, what I find as an editor of those stories is that the really tough stuff is very skimmed over and the stuff that's easy gets embellished and there's so much lovely detail. And it's like the dark stuff is what, and I don't mean dark as in negative, but the challenging stories are the ones that I feel like really provide the most insight and the most healing to the author. Yeah. You know, writing it down and and saying, you know, I I lived through this. I thrived through this. You, you're hitting you're hitting a chord with someone listening, including myself. I I've had it. I've had a difficult time sharing all of the toughest stuff. Right? It's easy to share the accolades. It's easy to share the big wins and the victories, but the tough stuff and 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 for a number of reasons, one, well, I don't want anyone feeling sorry for me. Or another reason is possibly that um, I, I'm, I'm a different person today and I don't want to feel judged for something I did 20, 30 years ago. And I'm just I'm, I'm just speaking out loud. Right. Sure. And. Uh, 
However, on the flip side of that is that perhaps in the in the in the right setting, in a safe setting, uh, that there are some ways to, as you said, to get healing uh, through that, and also to help someone else realize healing in their own life. Because when I hear people, it takes it takes like you said, it takes courage. It is not easy to do. Yeah, tremendous courage. It does. <laughs> So one of the things that often comes up when someone's working on sharing their story is like they they get they they prejudge. Well, when someone who also was part of this story reads it, they, what if they say that it wasn't that way? What if they dispute my memory? And this is an important distinction. Is and you've used this word several times as perspective. There is not one truth. There are many versions of a truth depending upon, and I always say, which perspectacles you're wearing. And your experience is true for you, as long as you're, as you said, being honest and 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 telling it from the best of your ability. And someone else could have a very different perspective. And, and the story of my brother and me is a great example. I had one very strong perspective and he had an equally strong different perspective neither of us were wrong yeah yeah i i really i i can appreciate that simply to share this has been my experience yeah. and that's your experience that's your reality and uh and that's that's okay that if your experience is different than someone else's uh, even even in the same setting even in Absolutely. the same context because gosh we we all have different ways that we understand and and observe uh, the world around us, and I think that's what part of the making the world. That's what I think dialogue. That's what makes dialogue, and having uh, true communication. Communication is not one person speaking only. It's not talking down or belittling. It's an exchange. Exactly, it's an exchange of ideas, and those ideas are based on my own experiences in life. And I think being willing to hear somebody else's story or of someone else's experience also opens up that light, that crack to say, oh, well, that is different. And how can I learn more about that experience, even though I personally have never lived it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And using the example, uh, the TED Talk example, the, the, the gentleman, the counselor, he didn't spend any time talking about all of the accolades or perhaps the people who were, you know, healed through his uh, through his work or the degrees or any of those things. He did talk about a little bit about him overcoming uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 obesity challenges through his wife and his help with his his community and his support. But uh, to your point, uh, he talked about some of the aspects of the challenges that that he faced and the, that others faced around him that, uh, that provided some context on not only where others are struggling, but to provide a new perspective, a new perspective on illuminating a pathway to, uh, to deeper health and deeper uh, healing in their own lives. Absolutely. How, how, I wonder how often we do that. I wonder how often we, f we start there. Because I think on the one side, it's like, well, I don't want people to think I'm complaining about my life, right? So like that comes in. And so, you know, what is, you, when we respond to that, you know, what is it that we say that can help people overcome that objection? Um, it's a really important one, because I think, again, that comes from a place of healing. And when you can look back on an experience and truly through your own eyes, see that there were pluses and there were minuses and, and, and say, yes, I lived this experience. This was how it affected me, but here's what I've learned from it. Here's what I decided to take away from it. I often use the analogy of a big backpack. I loved, I'm a long distance hiker. And so the first time I, I walked on the Camino de Santiago, which is a, an ancient pilgrimage in, in Europe, I had a 42 pound bag and I, I'm a Girl Scout. I had every possible thing that I could have in that backpack and it was heavy. It was really heavy. 
during that journey of seven days of long distance walking, I realized that that was very representative of the stories that I'd been holding on to from my childhood and from other experiences, the weight of it. And so I visualized taking out the heavy books of the whole story, looking through the pages and saying, this is what I want to take away from this. I don't need all this other stuff. I just need this little bit and kind of visually in my mind, pulling out the pages of what actually serves me today and letting go of the rest. And that metaphor works for me because all I could do is put those few pages back in my backpack and it was suddenly lighter. I felt lighter and I felt intense gratitude. Mm. Gratitude. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a great word to use. And it helps us to have appreciation and affirmation for, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's an old, uh, there's an old verse in, in scripture that says to be thankful in all things. It doesn't say to be thankful for all things because some things are thankless uh, and some things are really tough. But in, that's the point of gratitude. Like no matter how challenging my situation is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter what kind of trials I'm going through, no matter how uh, I feel like giving up, I can stand in some kind of an affirmation, gratitude that at the very minimum I can breathe. I'm still here. There's still hope. And through it, as you mentioned, I I look I tend to look at even in the moment, somebody you certainly we're talking about we're talking about documenting your past stories. But even the present, someone listening right now is in the present facing one of the most difficult challenges in their life. And it's not light and it's not easy. And one of the one of the ways that I learned to navigate through those moments is that I know that no matter how dark it is today, it was dark at another time in my life, and here I am, and I will overcome this not alone, because we, we're we're not we shouldn't isolate ourselves as human beings. Boy, we are, we, and we we've, we've had so much of that when we were in the pandemic, right? Right. But to but to but to know that I have others around me, even if they're not nearby, perhaps they're not even here right now. Perhaps they're just on this show and, and we're just having a conversation that will encourage me uh, to, just, to, just, to just get through the moment, to get through the day. And then every day will be a step forward. Um, what, what do you say when you're faced with those highest challenge situations to... To, to, to remind yourself that your story is still good, no matter how rough it is? Such a great question. Um, I'm going to link it back to gratitude. So when I was on the Camino, I lost my heel, like literally lost my heel on a very challenging downhill slope, not where I could end for the day. And every step I took was excruciating. And then I just started a gratitude mantra. I'm so thankful for my shoes. I'm so thankful for my heartbeat. I'm so thankful for, and I just started going and I realized while I was doing that, I don't feel pain. Literally, I couldn't feel pain. And as soon as I had that awareness, of course, I felt the pain. So when I came back, I did some research and the neurotransmitters that allow for pain also allow for endorphins, and they can't operate at the same time. So when we literally are going through the darkest moments of our lives, and we can find something to be grateful for, even our breath, or my heartbeat, I have a strong heartbeat. Um, this I've gone through dark challenges before I know I can triumph through this, even though it's hard, just going into that mantra shuts off the pain receptacles in our brain. And that's so powerful. My goodness, yeah. I tend to find if I set my expectation at the the the, the very basics of 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 uh, physiological existence, I can breathe. I can see. Some people can't see, mm -hmm. and we have to be sensitive to that. Um, and and I look at it like, how could I best honor those who have difficulty breathing? 
who have who are blind, who have other impairments, by living fully and not taking it for granted, by appreciating, right, by living in gratitude. And and there's another part of that gratitude that is also beneficial in that everything else I call it gravy. So if I'm in gratitude for just being able to breathe, then no matter what happens in my day, like it's it's extra, right? It's it's a plus. And then you say, well, Nate, isn't that like, you know, shouldn't you set higher expectations? <laughs> well, don't no. even get me started on expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get started on it, right? <laughs> I mean, look, um, the only thing I really expect is that I will have the courage to overcome the obstacles that I face every single day because I don't know what today will bring. I mean, this, this could be it. There's a great book by Don Miguel Ruiz called The Four Agreements. That is a short little book. I read it at least once a year. And he talks about, and I'm not going to remember them all. One is um, don't have expectations because that's when we get disappointed. That's where we feel let down. The second is always do your best. And your best in this moment could be different than your best yesterday and could be different than your best in five minutes, but show up with your best. And I wish I could off the top of my head, remember the other two, but, but it's a transformative book because it's really just teaching us to be present and not worry about what's going to come in the future because we have no idea. Even what we have in the past, we have no control. It's done. Let it go. Take yeah. away what serves you. Let the rest go and really be present in this moment. You know, as you said, focus on sustenance, like the, the, the basics, which aren't basic for so many people. And the rest is gravy. And then if we're lucky we get to swim in the gravy all day. Yeah. There's a piece that comes along with that. And someone listening is like, well, what about, you know, expecting the uh, ex having expectations in business or having expectations for people to drive on the right side of the road? I'm going to I'm going to throw out a challenge. Look, you can't you just cannot expect everyone to do the right thing. You can't expect that um, that the deadline will be met. Now, you want it to be, but. Just, there's there's just things that are beyond our control. And it's most things. I think it's even been said that control is actually an illusion. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, it is an illusion. Yeah. There, there, there's another topic for another day. And so, but getting back to the story piece. So books, let's talk about books, stories and books. You're a publisher, right? I am. All right. So are books dying? Oh, I do not believe they are dying. I do believe they're transforming. I think, you know, print books are still the top of the charts as term, uh, but hardback books are kind of becoming less important. Um, certainly have digital, you know, digital books as well as audio books, which I think actually digital and audio pretty much have the same sales data. But what I love about digital and audio books in particular is that it makes them more accessible because people who have learning challenges or visual challenges or auditory challenges, they don't necessarily access books the same way that those of us who have all of our senses, yeah. you know, working as we hope they will. And there's a, a shocking statistic that the number of people who have, are visually impaired are not learning Braille any longer, that it's we really want to make books more accessible. So I don't believe that books are dying. And yeah. my husband would say, if you look at our library. <laughs> <laughs> well, more and more young people are, uh, are turning toward uh, video content. And, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, there are some studies that I had just uh, checked on that uh, that talk about how important books still are. And in fact, it talks to uh, one of them, the younger generation, uh, according to a survey of the National Endowment for the Arts, says that 35 percent of Americans age 18 to 24 read literature. 
so um, however, this common sense media report in same 2019 says the average uh, American teen spends an uh, of seven hours and 22 minutes of entertainment media per day, which could contribute to a, a decline in book reading sure. uh, and uh, uh, adults though. Uh, adults, um, according to a survey in the Pew Research in 2019, 27% of adults in the United States report not having read any books in the past year, which is uh, which is interesting. I, I've read um, I've read a lot uh, as, as you have too. But, but here's here's what here's some of the great things about books. Uh, study published back in uh, the journal uh, Neurology in 2013 found that engaging in mentally stimulating activities such as reading books is associated with a slower rate of cognitive de de decline in old age. Uh, and then uh, Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center showed that regularly engagement in mental stimulating activities, including reading associated with reduced risk of developing Alzheimer's, increases your vocabulary and development skills. It also, um, it also interestingly, uh, it, a study conducted at New York University discovered that reading literary fiction improves the ability to understand other people's emotions and thoughts, fostering empathy and social perception. How about that? Those are really some powerful statistics right there. I do think that our attention spans are getting shorter. And so books that tend to be on the shorter side tend to be read in their entirety. There's some shocking statistic out there that if a book is 150 pages or less, I think 93% of people who begin it will finish it. Mm. So in terms of, you know, someone writing nonfiction, that's an important statistic. I'm not sure that the same statistic holds true for fiction because let's face it, if it's a great story, we're going to stick with it. Um, at least that's my perception. I do, I do feel like, so there were some interesting statistics that came out of the, uh, out of COVID, out of the pandemic in that shockingly audiobook sales declined like from, you know, 50, 60% down to single digits because people weren't listening on their commutes, but paper mm -hmm. books increased. And the reading of paper books increased and the more engagement of, of, of readers increased as well. Mm -hmm. I just don't have those statistics on the top of my head, but it was, it was remarkable. Wow. So if you're, if you're encouraging someone to, uh, uh, to write a book about their story, where, do, where does someone start? Um, I would say start with what's the end goal. Who is this book being written for? And if it's going to be published, that's an important question. Maybe your answer is, I'm just writing it for myself. I'm writing it for my family. It doesn't really matter, but it can be overwhelming. And so I would say, I, I, like, I, I always suggest making a timeline, birth to today, and then mark on that timeline significant experiences or happenings in your life. And they may not be your traditional, you know, I graduated from high school or I graduated from college, but what emotional shifts and when were they? And put those on the timeline. And then you can start to make notes about that. And I always say, do some free writing, write about that experience. What was it? Be as visceral as you can use all of your senses. What did it smell like? What did it feel like? Where did you feel it in your body when this was happening? And then you'll take each of those kind of big moments on your life and you'll, you'll start to say, okay, I want to go deeper here. You can write multiple memoirs of your life because memoirs are just snippets of a time and with a very specific story. It's not your whole life, which that's an autobiography or someone writing, you know, writing about someone else's life, which is a full biography. This is a sliver. And so the sliver is what we want to look at. We don't want to look at everything. Mm. And so when would someone be, uh, when would someone be encouraged to write their story? What, what, what would, what would somebody listening is like, well, I don't really have much of a story to tell, or perhaps I don't, uh, I don't have uh, an audience or I'm not motivated. 
Well, what would be a good reason or, or compelling reasons for someone sure. to tell their story? Well, I'll give you one. Have you ever lost someone in your life, an older person, a grandparent? My father. And then suddenly you have all these questions that you wish that you had an answer to. There are people in your life right now, someone who's listening, that someone's going to care about your stories, who you were, what you stood for, what mattered to you, how you dealt with your challenges. Someone's going to need that, even if it's only in your family. And so I think that sharing our stories that way is super important. You know, we've lost a whole generation of, of people. You know, I, with, I lost both of my parents in a very short period of time. And I, because I was a storyteller, I made the time to sit with them and just start asking questions and recording their answers, their voices. So I had their voice telling the story. And you can do the same thing. Maybe, maybe it's your child that may someday want to understand how you became who you are. You know, and if, if it's, if you don't feel motivated, that might be a whole nother thing. And maybe you're like, I, I often hear, I don't know how to write. I'm not a writer. Grab a tape recorder. Only thing that makes someone a writer is the act of writing. It's one of the few things you can say that about. You can't say that about brain surgery. You can't say that about an airline pilot, but you sure can say that about a writer. So good. That is so good. So good, Deborah. So they write the story. Then what? Well, if they if they're if they're feeling called to share it. In, in, the, in, in form of publication, then I would say, find an editor, find somebody who, and, and not all editors are equal. And there's multiple forms of editing. That's like kind of everyone's like, I need an editor. Well, do you need a developmental editor? Most likely you will. And they're the person that's going to go notice where you're skimming over things or sharing a lot of detail about unimportant things. Um, and they'll ask questions that will help you go deeper or help you formulate the story. I always say getting that first draft done is like Michel giving Michelangelo a, a, a block of marble. It's the editor's job to help you carve it into something that's beautiful and meaningful. So that's the next step is finding yeah. that kind of an editor. Wonderful. And then from there, share with the world, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. So your story is uh, a story that's developing and evolving. And I love to, uh, to end our, our time together with uh, a question about, uh, about your story. So as you get to the, uh, the great summit, the very end of this journey, uh, and you look back at all the people who you had the, the opportunity to serve and help, and all the things, the wonderful things you did. If anyone were to finish that story with one sentence about you, how would that sentence read? She was passionately enthusiastic about holding space for others to share their stories. Well, you are on your way. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Deborah. I really appreciate your time and just sharing these insights. And we'll make sure that people know how to find you as well you. along their journey as they tell their story of healing and of wellness and of triumph in the face of life's challenges. Well, thank you so much for having me, Nate. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. It's been my honor. <laughs>